Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 4 of the Film Score Podcast. Today, my guest and the first guest of Season 4 is Charlie Klauser. Now, of course, Charlie is most well-known for now scoring all 10 of the Saw films, the latest, of course, being Saw 10 or Saw X, which has just come out this weekend, right in time for October and for all of us to get into the spooky season. A little word of warning, there is no formal intro on this interview. Charlie and I were just chatting away before it started, and he was already getting into interesting stuff, and I didn't want to miss it, so I hit record. So, no, your ears aren't playing tricks on you. We genuinely just jump right into it. So don't feel like you've missed something. Now, of course, Charlie and I talk about the latest Saw score, his work on the series in general, and then kind of get all around into other things as well. I think my favorite part, and something that I love seeing in general, is near the end where he's talking about all these scores and composers that he loves, and the effects of the fringes of music on film scoring. It's always great to see composers hyping each other up. Now, of course, you can find out more about Charlie on his social media, on his website, and do the same for me. Obviously, season four is here. New episodes, new interviews every other Sunday. Outside of this, I've got three more lined up already. Great interviews. Promises to be an excellent season. I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you are too. But till then, sit back and enjoy. Well, at one point there was like, before the the writer's strike and everything took hold, it was, hey, we're going to do a great big red carpet premiere in Mexico City because that's where the movie was shot. And I was like, oh, great. I get to go to Mexico (laughs) City. Oh, I'll definitely be there because I never go to that kind of thing. But this time I was like, oh, an excuse to go to Mexico City. I'm 100 percent in. And then a little while once the strike took hold, they're like, yeah, that's not happening anymore. So (laughs) no Mexico City for me. (laughs) It's one of those things you don't really hear of composers visiting the set that often. And in no offense to the, the various film composers, they're not typically, you know, the, the stars of a red carpet event either. So that had to have been exciting to have that prospect before, you know, it was yanked from you. Well, that was mostly uh, me trying to make up an excuse to go to Mexico City, basically. <laughs> um, and, you know, a lot of, I do know that a lot of, well, some other composers are heavily involved during the, the shooting of the movie. I know that, for instance, the composer Joe Bashara, who does uh, a lot of horror movies, he's like super into creature effects and he mm-hmm. knows like the creature effects makeup specialists. And he's actually, I think he plays a monster or villain or dead body in many of the movies that he yeah. scores, but partly because he's so involved with that side of the production world for his own personal interests. And since I don't like build Fast and Furious cars or do creature makeup or anything, it's less likely that I'd be uh, visiting the set. Although I keep begging that they'll like let me be a, a, a dismembered corpse on the floor of one of the Saw movies. But so far, it hasn't happened yet. I mean, that's kind of reassuring because if you told me, oh, yeah, I have a fascination with creating just brutal <laughs> torture devices, I might be ending this early. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But Joe Bashar is an interesting person to mention because part of the the modern horse music sound landscape, you have guys like you, Joe, uh, Mark Corvin, who really like just create these, not much better way to put it, but just like a, a weird, brutal, noisy, painful soundscapes. And I, I mean all of those in the best way possible. <laughs> and it's it's not something that I think you really heard more than... 20 years ago besides you know weird outliers so i mean have you noticed more of a a prevalence like that as that's gone on and do you ever feel a bit of a friendly competition with those guys of continuing to advance the sound palette well i've definitely noticed the change in the sonic landscape of horror movies and movies in general, but more so in horror movies because horror movies through the 70s and 80s they were much more sort of thematic and musical and they'd have kind of musical hooks whether it's like a john carpenter movie with like a cool synth bass line or melodic 
thematic stuff, like even in The Omen or whatever, yeah. you know, that, that sort of style of horror movie music really has more of a link to the broader landscape of movie scoring, where there's strong melodic themes that can be associated with characters or situations. But I have noticed over the past 20 years or so that, yeah, things are descending into chaos <laughs> in a good way. And that composers like, and it's funny you mentioned Mark Corvin, because he's somebody whose work I heard on, I can't remember what the first movie that I heard that he had done was, but when I heard the stuff that he did on uh, The Lighthouse, mm -hmm. and then I saw this video, which probably every other film composer has seen, where he was demonstrating the, the nightmare sounds of the horror machine, which was this <laughs> sort of multifaceted acoustic instrument that he designed in, in collaboration with a guitar maker, who I believe is named Tony Duggan up in Canada. And they built this thing, which has a hurdy-gurdy element and, and a, a small guitar that you can use an Ebo on. And they called it the apprehension engine. And then he put this video up on YouTube where he was demonstrating the thing. And it got linked all over the place on music mm -hmm. blogs and that sort of thing and creative blogs and DIY music blogs and that sort of thing. And so I'd seen this video and uh, immediately started Googling and found the guys who were making it and there's one sitting right here, four feet away really? from me. Yeah, strictly because I heard the sounds that Mark had done in this little demonstration of it, and then I heard the sounds in his scores, and I thought, well, that'd be a fantastic addition to my toolbox, because I'm always looking for sounds that I haven't heard before. Of course, the scores that Joe does are much more orchestral, and the instrumentation is more sort of traditional than anything I do. And the stuff that Mark does is more minimalist and strange and odd and nothing that either of those guys do is directly like relevant maybe to what I'm doing in a Saw movie because Saw movies have become their own weird sub 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 genre where by either fortunately or unfortunately I've established like a sonic footprint for what those movies sound like and it feels wrong to deviate too far from that or mm -hmm. it would feel wrong if I didn't hit certain points in terms of the sonics and the element, the musical elements that I use. And so while I love what both those guys do, I don't look at it as a sort of competition because there's not a direct, it's like, well, you do your little weird thing over there and I'm doing my little weird thing over here. But at the same time, I was anxious to get my hands on that device, the apprehension engine that Mark had, had helped to invent because I figured well, I'm not going to use it for the same things that he's using it for, but it's a absolutely an innovative and unusual and curiosity-inspiring thing. You know, one of my favorite scores was uh, Hilder's score to Joker, yeah. which, again, isn't like directly relevant to what I do necessarily, but I appreciate how it worked and was musical, but also sound designy and dark and weird. And I thought it was amazing. It just it was, it fit the mood of the movie and it enhanced the, the mood of the movie and the story. I'm quite glad that this trend is, is, is well established that we're moving away from the sort of fanfare or thematic type of horror scores and more into dark and murky territory. Cause that's, where I would like to live. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and on that note, and I, I read a, an interview you did with Blake Fischer a while back for his, his second score to death book, where you mentioned that the music to the Saw films, because there's a significant amount of it, but some of it is really more sound design. And that seems to overlap exactly with what you're saying now about this different role or alternative role that film music can have in a film the films that influenced me before i was making music when i was just a little kid were those kind of things like for the same reasons that drew me to certain areas of making records and working with certain artists was if i heard a piece of music in a film or on a record and i could understand or imagine how it was made it was less interesting to me and the most interesting things that I would hear were those pieces of music where I had no idea how did they make these sounds? How was this put together? You know, if you listen to a Pink Floyd record, 
you can more or less understand what the ingredients are. There's a drum kit, there's some guitar, there's some bass. You understand what the spices were that went into that dish. Not that you could replicate it or do anything remotely as good as it, but it wasn't a complete mystery. But when I would see movies like the 2001 Space Odyssey or The Shining, and I realized those weren't necessarily composed scores. There was a lot of pre-existing music making up those scores. But still, when I would hear those Georgi Leggetti atonal choir pieces, I was probably nine years old or something when I first saw that movie, but I could not understand how such a thing was created. I understood that it was human voices, but how do you tell them what to do? How do you notate something like that? How do you imagine and create something like that? And so those were the mysteries that inspired me before I started making music. And then as I began to figure out how to do this, those were the directions I wanted to go in. I wanted to hear sounds I'd never heard before and that evoked a certain emotion. And for me, when I'm working on sounds, whether I'm fiddling with guitars and processing or synthesizers, whatever it is, a single note on the right sound can conjure up a whole world of hmm. emotion. And I'm fortunate that that's kind of how my mind normally works. Maybe it's that way for everyone. But when I hear a particular sound, if I'm flipping through a library of samples I've made or whatever, and I just hear one note being played on some sound, I think, okay, I know exactly where I would use that. But more importantly, here's all the thousand places where I wouldn't use that. So being able to associate, not even talking about the musical content and the notes and the chords and the melodies, before we even get to that, just the actual sound delineates the scenario it should be used in for me. And I remember having this conversation with uh, a younger film composer who's actually a teacher in a film music program in Australia. And we were watching a movie that a friend of hers had scored. It was sort of not a Breaking Bad type of thing, but there were some badasses in this film. Mm. And there was a kidnapping, and there was a guy driving a beat-up muscle car through the desert and stuff, and so there was a certain vibe. Now, obviously, you, you're not going to do the thing that you would do if you were scoring a show about guys in Texas restoring muscle cars, where you have, like, the rattlesnake sound and the slide guitar and all that. But in this one scene, there was, like, woodwinds. And this is a good friend, and the composer wasn't there, so I was able to talk shit. <laughs> and, and I said, well, that's totally wrong. And she went, what, what do you mean? And I said, well, the woodwinds, like that's not, the, that's not a badass in a beat up muscle car driving through the desert. There is no scenario in which woodwinds are appropriate given what I'm looking at on the screen. I don't care what the, the story might be a tender. He's going to find his daughter or, you know, it doesn't matter. It's, those woodwinds are wrong because this is not the physical place where woodwinds are appropriate given what I'm looking at on the screen. That, of course, sparked a whole discussion about, well, certain sounds, to me, are of a place, and they're only appropriate if some aspect of the movie relates to that place. You know, like big movie taiko drums. And as much as I would love to use them every day, and as much as I have tons of them filling up my hard drives and my collection of samples, for instance, in a Saw movie, they're almost never appropriate, to me anyway, because... So much of a Saw movie takes place underground, indoors, in darkness, in some dank enclosed space. And to me, whenever I hear big sort of movie style taiko drums, it sounds like the great outdoors. So if a, if a scene or a, or a sequence in a film is taking place indoors, I'd be like, well, that's not the sound that feels right for this. So those that might be a kind of a weird criteria, but it helps to narrow the endless list of options of how to approach a scene for me a lot of times. I can rule out whole categories of sounds and whole families of sounds because they don't feel like they're of the, the place that the thing is taking place in. I don't know if that's something they teach in film composing school because I never went. <laughs> but I mean, for, for you, and you know, maybe not everyone knows this, but you have this giant collection of sounds that you've filled up over time, over however many decades at this point. And so it, it really makes sense that that's one of the first things for you, or maybe the first thing. So is that like if you're trying to figure out the, the palette for a film or a particular scene, is that where you're going first of what sounds will be appropriate and what ones am I just getting out of here immediately? Well, I, I know that 
probably all film composers have ridiculous, huge collections of sounds. Mine may be more so because I'm super old and I've been collecting <laughs> sounds since, I mean, it's 40 years I've been collecting samples, you know, from back when I used to record them on my cassette Walkman, which was a rare one that actually could record back in the day in stereo, you know, in 1983, whatever. So I do have a huge collection of sound. And like I said, most film composers probably have massive collections of sounds, both ones that they've made and ones that they purchase as orchestral sample libraries or unusual ambient drone libraries, that kind of thing. And I scoop up all of those that I can find. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they come in the door, I just immediately roll through them and listen to every sound and sort of eliminate 95% of them as, well, I've heard that before. Oh, I'd never use something like that. Oh, that one sounds cheesy. Because there's just sort of a, a bottomless well of new sonic material, either to create or to purchase and choose from, I don't feel bad about just immediately removing nine-tenths of it or more from the playing field, leaving only that which is unusual, unique, weird, or interesting. But also, like many film composers, I do, before starting a project, sort of create a template which is basically an empty song in my audio workstation, which I use Logic on the Mac. And that template contains, I will roll through my massive collections with some knowledge of what I'm looking for. At the moment, my template is 976 instruments. And each instrument will be a, a full keyboard's worth of sounds. Some of those for instance, if it's drums, there might be a different drum sound on every key. On other sounds, it might be as simple as one audio sample that's stretched across the whole keyboard so that you can play it at different pitches. Mm. And then, of course, some of them are like strings and pianos and whatever, normal sounds. At the beginning of a project, like most composers, I will tweak that template. And in the case of a Saw movie, there's a whole family of sounds which are only permitted to be used in Saw movies that I wouldn't use in other productions, partly because they don't feel appropriate for other productions, and also partly because, in my mind, like Saw owns that sound. Hmm. They were made specifically for that, for a Saw movie, or for a character. So there's a whole subset in my collection of things that are wholly owned subsidiaries of the Saw franchise. But, I, you know, at the beginning of a project, I do roll through my whole collection looking for things that feel of a place with the story and the settings in the film. And I, while I'm doing this, I basically have the movie playing on loop, you know, as I sit there for four or five days or a week or whatever, mm -hmm. rolling through my sounds and going, no, nah, that's this, that sounds like something different. No, this one sounds like it's outdoors. I need more indoors, claustrophobic sounds. Being very organized and categorizing things so that while I'm working, I can find which one of those 976 tracks has the sound I'm looking for. But that process is sort of eliminates any wild goose chases or reduces the chance for wild goose chases in that a large bulk of the sounds that I'm likely to use on a piece of music for a Saw film has already been kind of pre-selected. You know, it's like TSA pre-clear or whatever at the airport. It's already at the gate waiting, and it's not out on the sidewalk with its suitcases. I also leave some empty slots within my little template so that if in the middle of while I'm working, I might say, oh, now I need a music box sound. Well, I wasn't thinking I would need a music box sound, so I didn't pre-select one and put that in my template. But I'll have some empty channels and empty slots that I can load up those wildcard sounds that are kind of per, very specific to one use or one scene. Probably most composers operate in some similar fashion. Maybe they're not as organized or as reliant on their own custom libraries as some of the stuff that I do, but it's not radically different to how a lot of composers work, I think. I'm not too sure, but I think. Near the end, you raised something that I'd actually been thinking about the last couple of days as well, where you're talking about you have these particular sounds that belong to, you know, Saw LLC. <laughs> but, but it's an interesting film series because I don't know if uh, if James Wan and Lee Whannell have been involved as, you know, a producers, executive producers on every film, but 
you've had, I think, five different sets of directors throughout the series. And, you know, the, the latest one, Kevin Gruter is, mm-hmm. is here, I think, who did, uh, what, six in Saw 3D and is now coming back. So you, you have these different people helming the film, directing it, and yet you are the, I don't know if it's the one constant, but you're or maybe the most obvious or known constant throughout all the films. So is there ever, and I don't, I don't want to say, you know, like a, a conflict, you guys aren't yelling at each other about this, but is there ever a, a tension between, you know, you having worked on everything, having developed what you think are integral sounds or sounds that are emblematic of the series, and then having, let's say, a new director coming in who might have different thoughts or ideas on that? Well, it's never really a struggle or a conflict Kevin, of course, has been involved in some way with almost all of the Saw movies. Mm-hmm. You know, he edited the very first one. And so he's been involved either in the director's chair or in the editor's chair for basically the entire franchise. So he he's kind of a special case. He knows Saw inside and out like I do. But as you said, through the series, various directors have rotated in and out. In some cases, they were part of the Saw family more than in other cases, but it's never been like any kind of struggle where the director says, oh, I don't think we should do this thing X, Y, and Z that we always do in Saw movies. That's never been the case. But it is true that different directors' visual styles and the way that they present a certain set piece, both through the art direction and through the camera angles and the editing pace and so on, those kind of affect how a film looks and feels and how what the correct quote-unquote music is going to be and you know for instance uh when darren bousman's directing the way he presents some of the trap scenes are almost more i don't know if gothic is the right word but they bring to mind remember in uh, the original silence of the lambs movie once sergeant pembry gets strung up in the yeah. cave, once once Hannibal Lecter sabotages the lunch delivery, and there's that one shot of, uh, maybe it's not Pembry, it's the other policeman who's been hung up like a figure on the cross, and it's backlit, and there's sort of rays of light coming from behind him. To me, that's almost like a gothic image. I don't know if that's even the right word, but that kind of visual style, there are some parallels between that kind of imagery and what Darren Bowsman winds up putting on the screen when he's directing a Saw film. And that affects what I wind up thinking is the correct kind of music and the correct approach. I remember on some of those scenes, on the ones that Darren directed, I wound up doing a more sort of, and again, I don't know if gothic is even the correct musical term or whatever, but a different style of music. It wasn't like industrial synths and heavy metal guitars. It was this sort of blum bum bum blum bum bum you know, this plodding, loping, thematic thing with strings and choirs rising in pitch as this piece progresses and depending on what's on the screen that might not be the right approach for instance in this latest one in saw x i only used that kind of approach for one scene because it was the one that was presented that way visually and that the editing pace felt appropriate for that kind of piece of music and the rest of the movie leading up to that scene is total mayhem and chaos and scraping <laughs> violins and industrial drums and guitars and, you know, stuff that's that has more in common with other movies in the franchise. And the way in which we, me and Darren, arrived at the correct musical solution for the films he directed was also very collaborative. He would put a piece of temp music that he had nabbed from some record or from some other film score, and that would be his music that he's listening to while he's editing the scene or maybe even while he's shooting it. And that at least gives me an idea of, oh, okay, here's an approach which might work, or here are some sounds which feel like they're appropriate to what I'm seeing on the screen. As far as the argument goes is the director saying, well, here's a piece of temp music I had. We weren't able to edit it to fit exactly, but it has a nice feel or a nice mood or a nice combination of darkness and hope or whatever. And that'll at least give me a springboard off of which with that information and the information that I can glean from our conversations and the information that is presented on the screen, that's usually enough data for me Mm -hmm. to fill in the gaps. 
as far as the the editing and, and how the film itself affects things, I, I watched Spiral last night, and the first trap is the tongue in, in, in the, the subway train tunnel. tunnel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And when that trap is first introduced, it's a number of fast cut shots kind of showing everything and that kind of i don't want to say necessarily say it dictates it but the music very much gets punchier and hits with those edits and it's so fast and unsettling so it's it's interesting then hearing you juxtapose something like that with a more grandiose shot or something like that instead and i very much respond to what's on the screen and my approach and the music that I'm trying to do, it's a response to what's on the screen. And obviously there's certain executive decisions that must be made in collaboration and consultation with the directors and producers about, oh, we don't want to foreshadow this. So we don't want the music to reveal this. We want the music to be behind the story in this part. But in this other part, we do want a sense of building anticipation and anxiety. So in that scene, it might be okay to foreshadow what's about to happen by means of impending doom in the music. Another aspect of how I approach things is I always want it to feel like the actors and the editor are basically dancing to the piece of music that hasn't been written yet. In the case of uh, for instance, working with Kevin, whether he's the editor or the director, is very he's very rhythmic in how he structures the picture edit. And not to say that there's sort of a grid and that all the shots are exactly 1.2 seconds long or whatever, but he does have a consciousness for maintaining a rhythm and having that rhythm build and speed up or feel more frantic as a trap scene or a sequence might be going along. You know, in talking with other composers, I, I, t I tend to feel like I'm a little too extreme sometimes in terms of how precisely I want to map out tempos and time signatures so that it's exactly eight bars from the moment the gun fires till the moment the door slams or whatever. Like, I always want things to be symmetrical and to not have a climax of a scene fall when I'm nine-tenths of the way through a musical phrase or whatever. Now, I'm sure all composers, they probably do, they'll probably say, you're full of crap. Everybody does that. But I know that at the beginning of a project, I'll spend a, a lot of time, like days, just listening to click tracks against the picture as I build those tempo maps where, I, okay, I'm going to start at 108 beats per minute. Then here, I'm going to just raise it just a little. And then when the play me tape starts, then I'm going to slow back down again. But then when the tape ends, I'm going to come back up to 112 beats per minute, and now I'm going to gradually increase in tempo until the first blade falls. Then there's a gap. Then I'm going to start back in again, but at an even faster tempo, and I'm going to go all the way up to 160 BPM by the time the final door slams. So I'll have these elaborate sort of maps of what the tempo is in an effort to not only have the picture cuts and the actor's motions feel like they're on beat with whatever rhythm I'm doing, but also to be able to accommodate any speeding up or slowing down as a scene is progressing. And then to also have that symmetry where the sections are musically literate or musically functional. And it's not two thirds of a measure when we get to the end of a phrase so that I never will be in a situation where I haven't quite finished this little musical phrase and now I need to end. I will adjust tempos and time signatures so that that musical phrase falls, the end of it falls exactly on the correct frame. That's probably just like the normal way film composing always works, but I always map that stuff out first before I'm even figuring out anything about the music really. And I'll also do that even if I know that the music in a scene is not going to be rhythmic, but it's going to be just floaty, ambient drone weirdness with no beat and no percussion and not even like a heartbeat kind of thump or anything. I will still take those pains to map out those tempos and that underlying roadmap so that even when something is floaty and ambient, there's still an underlying symmetry or structure that is not lopsided and doesn't have one leg of the stool shorter than the others kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like, so that whole process is made much easier when the editor, someone like Kevin, already works that way and has that as a, ref that's just his natural way he likes to structure picture. Because then 
when I go searching for the correct tempos that will work, I'm not fighting against a series of asymmetric pieces. And when I want to have the music speed up as a scene progresses towards its inevitable, terrible conclusion, well, that's what Kevin was doing as a reflex anyway. His edits are getting shorter and shorter and things are getting more and more frantic. In those cases, it's been easier to find those rhythmic solutions than in some other type of productions that I've been involved in where they weren't necessarily thinking in those terms as they cut the picture. Does that approach require you to have the final cut, the final edit, well in advance? Again, when I'm reading on online forums about different composers' workflows and stuff, a lot of times they're getting revisions of the picture edit all the way up to the last possible minute, you know. And that would make the kind of stuff I'm describing (laughs) very difficult because you'd elaborately craft some meticulous tempo ramp situation and then they say oh by the way we trimmed seven frames here and nine frames there and then all of a sudden your precisely aligned thing is no longer precisely aligned that does happen a little bit even in the saw movies although i try to work around any of those potential trouble spots until i know that the picture is Mm. well and truly locked in the old days, the, the term used to be, is the picture locked or is it not locked? Like locked is when there's going to be no further changes to the timing of anything. Yes, we might do some VFX to insert more digital blood splatter or whatever, but the length of anything is now locked. Well, over the course of the Saw movies, we've developed other terminology because there's kind of multiple levels of lock, as it turns out in a Saw movie. There's latched, which means, well, the gate is latched, but we haven't turned the deadbolt yet. So we we think this is the, the lock, but if we call it a lock and then we have to come back later and say, oh, we changed some stuff, then we'll feel bad. So we're only going to call this one the latch. The latch is usually what other people call the director's cut, meaning this is what the director thinks is the right edit of the movie. Unfortunately, it's nine and a half hours long. So inevitably, there will be further changes. Then the producers and the movie studio and others weigh in. And then you finally get to that point when they say, okay, now the picture is locked. But then there's always one more, which is when the MPAA, the bureau that certifies whether you get a PG-13 or an R or an X rating, they also dictate certain changes. And the way that that bureau works is it's very opaque process. They never come back to the filmmakers and say, you need to cut this scene. In this scene, there's one shot of the guy's arm being pulled off or whatever. You need to shorten that shot by nine frames. They never say, get into that kind of detail because they don't want to be in the position of being accused of being a censorship bureau. Technically, you could think of them that they kind of are, but they don't want to dictate to filmmakers, here are the changes you need to make. And I don't know this from personal experience of talking to them, but the secondhand reports that I get is that they'll say things like, we have concerns about this sequence Hmm. where the guy's arm gets pulled off. And then it's up to the filmmakers to kind of try to back into or reverse engineer what might be bothering them. Is it the fact that the blood splatter hits the camera lens? Or is it the fact that there's a pool of blood on the floor? You know, And they're never told exactly what needs to be trimmed or shortened. They just kind of have to take another swing at it and resubmit until they get their R rating. And of course, a Saw movie, like many others, is pushing right up against the limit of what's going to get an R rating or what's going to be an X rating for adults only. And they never want that. It has to be R rated, you know, Mm -hmm. at worst. Because if it doesn't make an R rating, it creates all sorts of problems for what theaters will show it and what cable channels will show it and all that. So they just say, no, we have to do whatever is needed to trim it back to get an R rating. And in that process, what was thought of as the locked cut does often or always change Just slightly. I mean, Mm. on the order of like, there might be seven frames they trim out of one scene. And so there are some little speed bumps like that that I wind up hitting even after I've crafted some elaborate sculpture of rhythms that are going to work exactly with the quote unquote locked cut. So far, it's usually been fairly minor. And all the the filmmakers are always very transparent with me about, okay, we know we're going to have trouble with this scene. We know we're going to have to take two or three swings at the MPAA with this scene. So if you got other things you can work on, don't build a toothpick replica of the Eiffel Tower for this scene yet. Because we're going to, until we get the MPAA to say, to sign off on the movie. And also the MPAA, I think the process is that you don't just resubmit a scene. 
and say, okay, well, we've tweaked this scene. What do you think now? It's like you have basically resubmit the entire movie with those changes in place in hopes that this time it'll go, th- it'll pass through. And I'm not sure if it's even the same people watching the thing each time it gets submitted. So it's a very opaque and tap dancery kind of process that the filmmakers have to go through to get to that final point. But fortunately, they usually are very transparent with me and warn me, like, we know we're going to have problems with this whole segment. We know that this whole first reel, it's just like, it's not going to be a problem because it's just people talking and there's no violence and there's nothing controversial at all. So that's locked. If I was you, I'd start working on that whole segment because we know that's not going to change. Fortunately, I've figured out how to negotiate those uh, troubled waters over the years. I mean, it does sound tough. It it also sounds like with the fact that you could be talking about single digit frames changing on a scene that it's it's almost like the do nothing buttons on various <laughs> gear right because look you watch a, a 90 minute movie i mean maybe you got a great memory but for me i don't know if i'd notice that but you know i'm not in the mpaa right and a lot of you know in a more traditional scoring process where they'd recorded an orchestra and then later after the orchestra has been recorded, then they say, Oh, by the way, we changed this scene and that scene and we shortened this by nine frames and blah, blah, blah. In those situations, then it just becomes a quote music editor unquote problem. Mm -hmm. And if you watch the credits to any big movie with an orchestral score, there'll be a list of music editors who were the people who were responsible for taking the finished recordings. And maybe they're going to extract one little segment of, the score from this scene and they're going to put it into a different scene in place of the music that was originally recorded for that because they think you know what i think this little sequence here works better with less computerized music quote unquote it's often a lot easier to accommodate changes in the picture and to also just juggle the music and say you know what we grabbed this 15 seconds from the very end of the movie and we're sticking it in the very beginning and the music editors can often do that without even involving the composer <laughs> And not without the composer, like, well, I guess I'm going to have to pop the hood on this sucker and get in there and rewire the spark plugs. However, you know, a Saw movie being what it is with its own little weird sub-genre of ultra-rhythmic kind of stuff, those kind of changes usually involve me being the one to pop the hood and rewire the spark plugs, which I don't mind. It's not necessarily industry standard to be that intense about the timing of things. Obviously, if you're working with more traditional orchestration, and the sounds are, quote-unquote, squishier, you know, floatier and softer without such hard and sharp attacks and rhythms, it becomes easier to Mm. manipulate either from a music editor standpoint or from whoever's standpoint. The music becomes a lot more malleable than I tend to (laughs) do in a Saw movie. The Saw scores tend to be very rigid and mechanical in, in the spots that are going to be the most trouble. So it's... A worst case scenario. It is kind of fitting because there is a a precision and a, a mechanical nature to those particular scenes, you know, as, as far as what they're actually showing. I've got one more Saw question for you, and, you know, it partially stemmed. I, I listened to like a 45 minute or hour long playlist earlier of the various Hello Zep cues and variations. It's just a staple of these movies and of your scores. On crafting those, I mean, how are you keeping some of the ingredients, the things that recurring viewers and listeners are going to know, while not simply doing a, I've I've done this nine times already, here's the tenth, and it's basically the same thing. <laughs> you know, in some installments in the franchise, the inevitable Hello Zep iteration has been, in some cases, it is radically different. In some cases... It kind of can't be because the structure of what the picture edit is wants it to have those certain propulsive Mm -hmm. rhythmic sections. And even on on this one, I I was reading some posts on like a saw subreddit or something where people are saying, oh, I hope this Hello Zep number 10 is going to be a radically different reinterpretation of the theme and not reuse this section from Saw 5 and this section from Saw 8 or whatever. And I didn't post a reply because, the, unfortunately, the reply would be, well, there's only one new section and it's about 40 seconds long. Of course, the entire piece of music gets reworked and tempos get adjusted and new, new overdubs get added. But some ingredients remain 
20 years old, like that little jingly kind of dulcimer sound that starts all of the cues. That's the original recording from 2003. And it kind of has to be like if I would use any one of the 10,000 other dulcimer sounds that I have on my hard drives, it just changes the whole character of the piece. It's like when they replace the voice actor for a beloved character in an animation. So I'm very cognizant of that. And I feel that way too. Like if they changed the sound of Darth Vader's lightsaber, you know, I'd be writing letters to my congressman. Like you can't do that. It's got to be the original. I'm not sure if all the fans know or care, but when I'm re-attacking Hello Zep for the 10th time, I know that I have to use that exact identical cheap sounding dulcimer from 2003 and the original string quartet sounds that I recorded back then. And then there's like a whole series of mega drums and clanking metal percussion that I added somewhere in the middle of the franchise. And that signifies the twist ending expanding. So like the cue starts with the traditional elements from 2003. And then there's a sort of break. And in this version, in Zep X, as it's called, there's a new string part and new melodic elements, which are drawn from the thematic elements earlier in this movie that have never occurred before. And then it reverts back to Saw 5, 6 era mode with the turbo tom-toms and the clanking drumsticks on metal pipe percussion and this sort of chugging strings, you know, going dun, 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 which never occurred in the first few movies, but made an appearance kind of in the middle of the franchise. But those have significance in the way that they relate in the timeline mm -hmm. to what the actors are doing and saying. At this point in the Saw franchise, the twist of the twist ending is stacked. It's like a multi-twist. You know, <laughs> we, we get to the, the ending reveal and it's a twist, but then there's another layer to the twist and even another layer. And so where those various phases of the evolution of the Zep theme, where they occur in the timeline relates to which layer of the twist is being revealed. And maybe none of that has any significance to the fan, to the, even to the hardcore fan. But to me, that dictates the structure of what the music winds up being. And of course, it's a radical restructuring in terms of the tempo and the timing of sections and massaging all this to fit very precisely against the picture and to build to a shattering crescendo and end exactly on the cut to whatever. A lot of that may not be readily apparent unless you put the old mix up against the new one and you go, you know what, this new one's actually, it's getting faster towards the end, only by a little tiny bit mm -hmm. to match the picture. But that whole process is an effort to retain the beloved original sound of Darth Vader's lightsaber, <laughs> but be doing it in the, you know, the ninth sequel kind of thing. So it's, it's a bit of a tug of war. And I know that although there may be angry letters in the forums about, he didn't change very much about this Zep X. It's like, well, actually, if I had done what you wanted, I would have wrecked it. All of a sudden, Darth Vader's <sighs> would be a different recording. And it, it, it can't be. It has to be the original recording from 1977, or it's not Darth Vader, <laughs> you know? And that's just kind of part of the fabric of a Saw film. And that's always a battle to some degree of how much new material can I inject into this beloved theme without totally wrecking the thing. So it always starts like you'd expect and it always ends like you'd expect. And then I intersperse some new elements and some elements from the middle of the franchise into all that journey through the middle in hopes that it won't sound like some hodgepodge cut and paste effort. And look, I, I don't think as we learn more and more, you know, being chronically online, <laughs> it is impossible to please everyone. And right. in one sense, if you made something that made everybody happy, it's kind of boring. And, you know, to some degree, my decisions are reinforced by the producers, by Oren Coolis and Mark Berg and the director, who are a hundred always 100% on my side and even more than 100%. And sometimes they'll be like, okay, we want this Hello, this version of Hello Zep has to be an absolute banger. Has to be like, take all the best elements of all the previous nine and every time it puts a smile on our face in any of the previous nine, that section has to be in this one. They don't want me to tear down the house and build a new house that looks sort of like the old house. They want basically to remodel the kitchen. Not to tear, not to knock out walls, 
And they're a hundred percent on my side. They're like, no man, it has to sound and taste and smell like hello Zeph, but we need to amp it up here and we need something new here. And then we'll come back to, we want the end of it to sound just like it did in saw one. So there's all this little sort of mini roadmap that we all come to agreement on before I pop the hood and start rewiring stuff. Before I let you go, I do have one thing I want to ask. I actually talked to Tyler Bates earlier this year and wanted to ask him this and, you know, either forgot or ran out of time. But you got involved with Trent Reznor, Nine Inch Nails, Marilyn Manson back in like the early mid 90s. And, you know, especially from that kind of broader industrial scene, you see a lot of those guys then having an effect on film and film music. Obviously, you know, Reznor Ross, Clint Manzel, Tyler Bates came a little later, Rob Zombie obviously directing films and then bringing in a number of guys like John Five and a few others. So why do you think that that scene ended up having such an impact on film and really as we've seen the last 15 years in film music as well? Well, I do have a major theory on why they're allowing idiots like us to take the (laughs) helm of film music and part of that is if you're trying to compose for film in 1982 the executives and the producers and the studio heads and all that they didn't grow up listening to badass music they grew up in a different generation listening to whatever frank sinatra or you know elvis who knows but not like whatever was at the cutting edge so you were fighting an uphill battle back then at trying to inject more current or progressive or up to the minute musical approaches because it kind of went against the grain of this established palette of sounds and musical styles but it also was against the cultural grain of the decision makers but now over the past 20 years now when you go into a meeting with studio executives or whatever and they say, hey, weren't you in Nine Inch Nails? You know, I was I was at one of your shows in 1995. I was 17 years old and I was losing my mind on mushrooms. And <laughs> so it's a different generation of people that are at the helm of these projects. And they grew up immersed in a different styles of music than the previous generations. And so they're much more receptive to letting people like us in the door. And they've also... You know, I've heard this a couple of times. They say, you know, I remember when I first heard the the Nine Inch Nails album, The Fragile, I thought this would make an amazing film score. Well, Mm. here here we are. And then the second part of the answer to that multi-part question is that the musical styles of people on the fringes, whether it's Rob Zombie doing like ultra monster metal music or Trent and Atticus doing this sort of very cerebral, but still kind of distorted and troubled, sonically troubled kind of music. All of those styles are kind of at the at the extremes or the when they were making records, the, the musical styles and the sonics of their records were sort of at the outer edges of whatever their genre was. You know, Rob Zombie's music wasn't like traditional metal. It was like super hot rod cartoon monster metal. It was like extra, extra something. And maybe the purists who are into Slayer or whatever are going to say, that's not real, metal. you know, but... Whatever he was doing was at some, he was pushing some limit somewhere in the same fashion, but in a different style to the way that Marilyn Manson or Trent Reznor and Atticus Roth or other rock musicians, quote unquote, who have moved into film music in the similar fashion, but different genres. They're also pushing the extremes of what their musical styles can be. And I think it's that is the common thread Mm. that makes their work able to translate well into film because it's a very purist kind of ethos and all of the stuff that's inappropriate or not good or just plain old not cool has been boiled off from their music and if you listen to clint one of clint mansell's first couple of scores was uh, the movie pie and Mm -hmm. uh, then requiem for a dream and if you listen to requiem for a dream i mean it's very traditional in some ways in that it's hey, I hear violins and cellos. It's not like outer space sounds all the time, but the music is so bold and in some ways simplistic, but it's this insistent and bold structure to it, which is very different to how someone who came up through the ranks of orchestral composing and orchestrating and all that, those kind of people wouldn't have wound up with 
the end result that Clint wound up with, which was that, you know, that memorable theme, the Lux Eterna yeah. theme from Requiem for a Dream, which is, was, you know, in every movie trailer and ad campaign for like 15 years because it was so, what's that line from Apocalypse Now? It was like, I was shot with a diamond right between the eye. You know, there's this incredible boldness and strength that really was like a, a lightning bolt in a blue sky. And I think that is the aspect that filmmakers respond to and they say, I, that's, I want my film to feel like that. I want my film to feel like it's this bolt from the blue that no one's ever seen or heard anything like this. And it just leaves such a, an indelible mark on the viewer and on pop culture. And I want it to feel like that last 15 seconds of American beauty, where it just feels like you just had an ax fall on your head when that last line is delivered. That element of, strength and boldness and purity if you can call it that i think that's the thing that filmmakers want to draw from the type of musicians that we were just talking about who are operating at the fringes at the outer extremes of their genre you know and that's what drew me to working with rob zombie because it was the most turbo in some cases it was almost like ridiculously cartoonishly turbocharged ultra metal you know and I was piling on drum loops and crazy synth sounds. And he never said, no, it's too much. It was always a case of, can we go more? And that's what I responded to in working with him. And similarly, when working with Trent, it was a case of, no, we have to do things that have never been done. And we have to find sounds and approaches that are not what anybody else would normally do. Okay, that's easy enough, quote unquote. But then what makes him so talented and skilled is then we also have to make that work musically and make it feel satisfying. It's one thing to just make some arbitrary rule like we're going to make this entire song with no crash cymbals on the chorus. Like every rock song has a crash cymbal on the, you know, at the beginning of every section. Well, it's easy enough to make an arbitrary rule like that, but then to make the song still hit hard hmm. without resorting to those everyday tricks that have become commonplace then that's a, a little more difficult and i think that's what the success of those outsider kind of game plans in the case of trent Naticus and other artists we're talking about when they succeed at those at coloring outside the lines but still making it work that's the thing that filmmakers want to, to pull from and i think that's why we see people from quote unquote the fringes having some success in the film scoring world Johan Johansson, rest yep. in peace, and Hilder, their approaches. I remember when I first saw the first Sicario movie, I thought, this, oh, I cannot believe how good this music is. Another movie that Johan scored, Prisoners, with Hugh Jackman. I remember seeing that movie and thinking, this, this is amazing. I, I love this movie. I love this music. It's murky and indistinct, but still powerful in some way. It's, the music was simultaneously gentle and also powerful. But there was like almost no drums. And I was, you know, I thought this is the kind of movie I want to see and the kind of music I'd like to make. And I remember having this conversation with my agent saying, oh, I just saw this fantastic movie that nobody saw, nobody cared about. And, you know, it had this like murky, indistinct score. And that's the kind of, I'm sure you could get me a, a movie like that because nobody wants to, all the big guys don't want to score <laughs> movies like that. And he kind of said, sit, sit down, son. Let me tell you something. Everybody wants to score a movie like that. <laughs> you're not like it's not like oh that movie didn't break box office records so nobody wants to score everybody wants to do that kind of movie and i was like oh i was kind of heartbroken and i said well who's this and i this was before i knew anything about johan and his background mm -hmm. and everything and i said you know who's this guy this johan johansson guy that scored this thing and of course my agent said, he has a long long history as a modern classical composer he's been breaking boundaries and making new rules for years decades now he didn't just come out of nowhere and i was like oh well, well all right I'll, I'll just go back to scoring saw movies now but those kind of moments when something new and bold is introduced even if it's not a thousand piece orchestra but it's new and bold in terms of its approach and how it resonates with the picture and with the audience those are the moments that i think filmmakers are searching for and those are the moments that I'm searching for just as a casual movie watcher. I love it. What an excellent, excellent response. And also, I think it's it's <laughs> one of those responses that will certainly have me and hopefully other people listening in thinking a little differently, both 
of the actual music that we're hearing, but also why it's some of these people right. picked to make that type of music. But I really appreciate your time. I'm I'm glad you let me uh, just keep asking away. C- candidly, hey. I, I could, you know, lock you in there and keep going, but... Good know. luck editing this down to a manageable <laughs> length, but yeah. It's been my pleasure. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs>